vocabulary where you know the source, also the time because terms keep uh, changing their meaning uh, over time. So, uh, and I think uh, a networked or a arithmetic um, structure for the vocabulary is very helpful for that. Okay. Thank you. Um, I propose now, unless there is a very urgent question <coughs> from the audience to either Christina or Nina, to have a very short break before we uh, go on with the conversation with Stana Vazulka. So just a break to go to the toilet or to stretch the legs and then in about six, seven minutes, ten minutes we, uh, ten minutes max, ten minutes uh, past of the future. And um, we're on the table here with um, our honored guest Stana Vazulka, who I suppose doesn't need any introduction, but nevertheless I'll say that uh, she's one of the pioneers of video art and also one of the pioneers in um, things like um, interactive video art. Um, she built a, a violin which controls live video and you can uh, see some of her video stuff um, here in the gallery at the Frascati, so please take a look in the a good look um, when you get a chance in the in the pause between uh, the panels or later on. And uh, on my other hand is uh, Lucas van der Velde, who is also an artist, uh, part of Telco Systems. They do uh, also yeah, live generated computer video and music, which he programs, which they program themselves in MUX. And he's also director of the Sonic X Festival, which I also work for. And we're going to try and uh, have a conversation about uh, archiving, about the new past, about how we deal with the past of art, which is ephemeral and which actually you should have been there to feel what it was really like, but still we want to get access to that history, so how do we do that? Of course, uh, Stana Vazuka uh, was one of, probably one of the first as well to really archive the work of uh, the Vazukas, also the work that she did together with Woody Vazuka, uh, on the internet, and there is a great website still, vazuka.org, which gives you a great insight in to the, the work that they did, uh, including technical descriptions and video. And, um, but I first want to give the word to Lucas, who's quickly going to introduce saying what Sonic Acts is and sort of what Sonic Acts' interest in archiving is. Hello. Um, thank you, Ari. Um, I first would like to thank Taku and Dick. Um, for asking us to host this session with Steina. Um, I think for my generation of um, artists and also organizers, it's um, the generation of Steina that uh, really opened our eyes and had um, an immense um, influence on how we um, see the world. So. I'm really happy that we finally sit at the same table and uh, that we can talk a bit about this because this is really uh, um, it's really exciting for me to um, be able to meet with somebody who has been um, working in this field um, way longer than I've been around. So that's really good. Um, I'm here um, <coughs> because. Taku and Dick asked us as Sonic X to host this session. Sonic X is a small festival every two years in Amsterdam. Um, and it's, um, it, the festival started as a um, collaboration between the Royal Conservatory in The Hague and the Interfaculty um, Image and Sound together with Paradiso to bridge the gap between um, high art and uh, low art. Um, especially on the performative side. And so from the, I think, the first edition or the second edition, Stein was also involved in this um, 
collaborative effort and um, it started out as a festival to show new ways of um, uh, stage performance with new tools, with new instruments. So over the years it um, slowly developed into uh, a festival that focused more broadly on um, technology and art, um, on the spatial qualities of it and the I think we are now at the point where the festival is uh, mainly dealing with the, um, the way technology um, manifests itself. Uh, because the fascinating part about technology is, of course, that it does not have any um, real spatial property, uh, um, properties in, in a certain way. So it's it can be a lot of things and it can also be nothing. And this is also a very interesting point, I think, if we talk about archiving, that a lot of uh, current technology um, is almost contradicting this whole idea of you know, a painting and you take good care of it and it stays good until you know, a few hundred years or so. Um, so, we, we also, at Sonic X, we showed, um, last edition, we showed the work by Steiner, Somersault. Um, that's another link. Uh, but I think we should start having you talk, because uh, okay. I think that's why everybody's here. Yeah. And um, I think we... At least I would like to know a bit more about how you, um, from working with technology, making art for the last 40, 50 years, what this whole archiving thing, how, how do you see that? Because there is the Vazuka archive, and then there is uh, the Nimka archive, there is uh, electronic art intermix, and then there, there's a lot that's not in all these archives. You have it. But how, how, um, how do you see this whole thing with making your own work public? And what do you make public? See, uh, I come from Iceland. And I think every Icelander is an archivist. I'm not sure, but they look very much back in history. They have this rich history, old history, and they, they are very much about preservation and preservation on truth. <coughs> like, uh, I know the name of my 34th grandfather. His name was Harald, and he was in Norway. And uh, if I was into it, I would know everybody in between. Uh, my sister does it. Uh, I remember when I was a kid coming home uh, for, from school with a friend, my mother would ask the friend, who owns you? That's an Icelandic expression. Who owns you? And the kid would say who? And she would say, aha, you are related to Steina. You are like third and fourth or fifth and sixth. You have a common uh, grandfather on the mother's side or, and so on and forth. They all do this and they still do it today. So uh, it was natural for me from the day we started in video to collect. I collected the posters, the programs. Uh, I just didn't throw it out. And um, Woody was actually surprised in the end when, when we started uh, trying to see what we had, that we had everything, because it did not occur to him that he would keep those things, you know. And it is strictly national, I would say. Anyhow, uh, there is an enlightened man from Canada. He was working at the Langlois Foundation, Jean Gagnon. He came to see us and was very uh, impressed when he saw that uh, all these papers existed and he wanted them. And here comes another thing that's interesting in my and Woody's attitude. It doesn't have to be a physicality. It doesn't have to be the paper. If you can scan it, the scan is as good. It, it, that is the material, that's the knowledge, that's the value, is what is written and what is said, and not in what medium. 
So we agreed because he offered nice money. But before anything could go up to Canada, we scanned it. And since this is already 12 years ago, you understand that scanning wasn't as crazy then as it is now. So it was interesting that we would just scan everything we had, put it into boxes and send it off. But what was then interesting was that uh, if I wanted to know something about something and I typed in a name or whatever, it, I came always up in the Varsolka archives. You see, you type in something like Video Rockefeller Foundation, come up in Mauer, that was the only thing that was available, was on our archives. So that was kind of fun, kind of irritating too, but so it was. So this is the beginning of our archives. And then, of course, we ran out of money, but we keep living. It's strange how we just keep living, you know, by grace of somebody, maybe, I don't know. And so keeps, uh, stuff keeps accumulating, and we pay no attention to it. We don't have any money to uh, scan again and do more. So we are kind of at a standstill, although uh, Woody has become very obsessed with continuing this effort. So, uh, strangely enough, somebody heard about uh, us from, from Boulder, Colorado, and they are professional archivists, whatever that means, I don't know. I don't know what a professional archivist, maybe you can tell me what they do. <laughs> the same that we do, I think. <laughs> Keeping stuff and making sure there's good descriptions and making sure it stays in good condition. Yeah, but then... Um, it, but just to know more about it. Yeah, but isn't there kind of like a spreadsheet or three-dimensional points where uh, where information uh, meets? So you can, uh, can you explain that a little bit? And then I'll continue. Just the three sentences. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, it's important when you archive things, especially now that, as Nina also showed, that you have good descriptions. Because maybe eight years ago, when you put in a search video, Rockefeller Foundation, you will end up in the Vazuka archive. But uh, now you might want to type in video, rotating video, uh, rotating trees, uh, green colors, and hoping you'll find uh, one of your videos. Um, like, isn't somersault, something like that? Yeah. Um, so it's one of the tasks of a good archivist is making sure that such a description is available, but also that such a description is correct. Um, especially now that stuff is copied over the net and made available on blogs and gets written up and sometimes it becomes very difficult to find out if something is actually from 1972 or 1973 and if the premiere was on the 12th of October or the 14th of October. At this moment I'm wondering if the premiere of Intona of the Graimakers was actually at V2 or at Frascati. Mm -hmm. I could find out because I assume there's good records. But So the task of the archivist, I think, is also to make sure that this information is there and that this information is correct. So at least at one place you have, uh, you have a record which people can trust as being yeah. the right information. Yeah, I remember. So it's a, it's, a, it's a simple task and it's a complex task. It's, it's a complex time. task, yeah. I remember that uh, I thought it was totally um, irrational that we, t we have, would have information about who were the recipients of Rockefeller fellowships in 83. It wasn't us, so it wasn't a personal history and why it should sit on our archives. But that's what's so interesting. The, the, uh, we thought then that there should be some hub, some universal international archives that held all truths of history from beginning on. But it doesn't matter because uh, it can be as dispersed as you know millions of stations because the internet, if it's there, it finds it. 
if you have typed in the right word. And it's very interesting philosophically to think that it doesn't matter physically where it is. Mm -hmm. And the only requirement really is that it exists in duplicates somewhere elsewhere. That uh, it's a volatile medium. I, I am told. I don't think it's so volatile, but I think that if it exists at least in two or three more copies, all truths on earth, that it will somehow survive. Is it true? How do you think about Well, I think certainly that the more copies you have, the greater your chance is that uh, digital material or material will survive in 10 years or 20 or 40 or 50 years time. Um, what you'd like, and I think that's a task of the archivist and the, and the historian as well, what you would like is also a record somewhere um, with descriptions, etc., that tells the future generations what it actually what it actually is that you find. Um, so it can be completely dispersed, but you still need, well, maybe not an institution, but something like that, which makes sure that the, that it stays there, even when people stop seeding it. Let's call it like that. I mean, that's a torrent model. Um, and it makes sure that it's preserved. Um, so but that's, that's kind of looking into the future also of, of how you could archive digitally and how a past lives on. Um, the other thing would be, and maybe more interesting, even if the past really lives when it's being re-in- reinterpreted every time. So the way that your work is an inspiration for the generation of artists of Lucas. Yeah. Um, Thank God I don't have to go there and teach, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but you'd like to have, uh, or I suppose that you would like to ensure that something like that happens. Yeah. Um, one step further, and that's that's a question that I would have for you. If I look at the Fazulka archive, mm-hmm. um, it has a very clear structure. I mean, you have a description of the work, you have a couple of photographs when they're there, there's a video of an installation when it's there, there's technical descriptions as well. Um, is it there also in order for future generation to be able to show the work again, to kind of install it thanks to these descriptions? How important is that for you? No, I don't really think so. We didn't do that part, and uh, but it might it might become. But it is interesting how when you think about archivists, they are going to be so important. Uh, you know, they are, they are going to be the keepers of the history. And in the past, they weren't. Uh, how were archives of the past di- done before it was digital? That is when it really sat somewhere in a hub and you would have to fly maybe for eight hours to go to the archives and see them, right? That's true. On the other hand, the um, example that you just gave about how the Icelandic go about their own history shows the other uh, model, which is that knowledge of this past has become so much part of the society that it lives on. Yeah. Of course, there's the record, there's the, the Islendinga book, if I say it correctly, which is yeah. the book uh, which have, has all the names of the people um, who emigrated to from Norway to Iceland. So that's the, the special thing about Iceland is that uh, they know all the names of the people who went there in 900,000. And, and you have the London book. So the, the record is there. So mm-hmm. there seem to be... So kind of the reason for me also to archive things is to be able to, for this, this history to live on. Yeah. To, that someone in 20 years time will be able to be inspired and maybe try to remake the work or make new work which is inspired by it. Yeah. I know it, that's it, sort of maybe the, no, it's the kind obvious of, thing. Yeah, it is a kind of a total miracle. When you think about it, that the digital archives that, that live on the web, web is a miracle already too, and so on, it, it, it changed everything. But I tell you something interesting. A friend of mine made a composition, a modern composer, as well as my age. We knew each other from kiddie school. 
Um, I saw his composition and I looked at the text and I said, I know this text. We learned it, I think, in school. Where is this text from? It is magnificent. And it was the text was written 800 years ago. And I thought it was interesting both that it was written 800 years ago and that I had to learn it as a child. Uh, it's so beautiful, it is beyond imagination. But uh, it is that, because I have lived all my life outside Iceland, and you come suddenly and realize it is that tight, you know, that they will make, make a melody to an 800-year-old text and I will recognize the test and a text, and so probably most Icelanders, you know, it is it is peculiar. But now we don't have to learn anything or know anything. We don't because we can always find an 800-year-old text on the internet. So that's kind of the downside of it. <laughs> but, um, memory, human memory, is uh, diminishing as the digital memory increases. This is, of course, the other question. In, when you started, um, there's maybe one picture of something you did or a little note. And now if you do something, mm. we probably record it with 40 cameras and everything will be... Hours and hours of material will be there. But what, of course, you know, if, if we do not have the time to watch it all back, and if we do not memorize it, then what is the meaning of that in terms of, you know, the the mythical stories about the 60s with certain concerts or happenings and, you know, maybe it's good that there's no high-def video recording of it because it would probably destroy yeah. this whole myth. And so, you know, and this is what we talked about uh, this morning, you know, this archiving, trying to fixate everything versus anthropology, you know, you just have a few things. So, if you would now make a new work, would would you choose for just document it as um, diverse as possible, or would you still just do it as you've always done it? I mean, is there a change in how you look at your work in ter terms of documenting it for the future, for instance? No. No? No. So nothing no. changed? No. no. No, I think there has to be a new generation that does it. That has to be the attitude. See, I, I grew up learning to, uh, to look to the past, you know, especially coming from this country I came from. You look to the past, but now you start looking to the future, and which is as valid, or maybe more valid, but it, it, it totally changes the attitude. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, How what do you go about that? What I find interesting about the whole question of archiving, what we also experience in a uh, you know, very small part with the uh, festival, is that um, for a long time we thought about uh, the archive and opening it up as something that had to do with the past. But in a way, everything you do will become part of that, and then you have to think about it again. So I'm just curious if... Archiving is not something that you should uh, encode in the way you work in order to have it archived by the time you finish the work or finish a performance. Or yeah. This is, of course, easily on paper because when you make a work, it's usually more important than the documentation. or the. But what I fi find also very interesting is, I mean, you collect a lot but then what gave me a lot of insight is for instance this uh, documentation binary lives yeah and it's almost as valuable as a archival document in my what i see see there as for instance the archive you have online yeah. can you say something about this documentary and well i mean we do document a lot, both me and Woody, because we like to take this camera and when guests come or somebody, to point, intimidate them a little bit. So it makes for a lot of footage. And coming back here, I realized that I, 
have quite a bit of things from Stein. I would walk around when people were doing their experiments or concerts or whatever and tape it. And I've never looked at it, but now I think I should look at it and see what I have. It's maybe valuable. <laughs> but uh, it kind of, it, it is such fun to go around with a camcorder and have it ready. So I was here in this hall and uh, Trevor Richard was sitting right where you are sitting there. And he was trying to talk, and he was not really succeeding. So in the middle of a sentence, he broke out in a sing-song and he, uh, to demonstrate what he does, because he does these extended vocalizations. And I had the camera on him, so it's a piece that I, I could probably find it here. I think I have it, but uh, let's skip that one that I perform a lot because it is kind of totally perfect. And these are the, the valuable moments. You just happen to be somewhere and you happen to have your camera. And I actually want to show you something when, when we come to the end of this session of uh, Michelle Weisfish where that was here in the hall next to this one. Wasn't it, Joel? Yeah, because you did the sound. <laughs> Um, and uh, where, where, where he had been performing the night before and I took the performance into the computer and played it the uh, next night uh, through the Imagine. So, uh, so uh, I don't do this anymore. I, have, I don't have a camera in my pocket anymore. But so I cannot explain why I could be so passionate for all these years and do all these recordings and then it's like, uh, don't do it anymore. And when I need something, I borrow a camera to do it. Um, it's maybe just progression of age, what do I know? But uh, uh, isn't that, where does that fit to be always be constantly documenting to be uh, be there in the moment. Of well, that's that's the interesting point, of course. If you look at nowadays, it's yeah. in a sense uh, you and Woody were sort of first generation of people buying the porta pack and kind of starting to document just everything that was around. Uh, something which has become mainstream now, and uh, yeah. you have these people constantly updating not only their status, but also constantly sending out their movies uh, to their friends. And I don't think it's uh, significant that you stop doing it at the moment when it has become mainstream. Yeah. Um, but it, it brings out the question that also Lucas was trying to get at. Like, if we have so much material, who's going to look at it? And uh, because what's important in the end is, is what lives on and how it lives on. Yeah. And um, that brings us back maybe to also, again, the issue that's also what it, where the idea of the myth is important. Kind of, mm -hmm. if there still is something to dream about and imagine about a past, maybe that's more important for the production of new work than when you have the 40 camera registration of the performance which allow you to exactly well I don't think that's possible but to recreate it so you have to throw away all the time tapes immediately when you I don't think so go, go home because I think there's <laughs> throw it there's away. a fine line between what is uh, really valuable and what you would have liked to keep yeah. and the sort of things that you would want to reenact and maybe the stuff which you don't want to do again um, that, that's another question that I was trying to ask you just a minute as well. Yeah. But how would you feel if someone would, in 20 years' time, try to do a performance of you anew? Um, are you... There's, of course, artists that have the idea, like, well, technology has progressed, yeah. so use the better technology to get at a result which maybe I could never get at 20 years before, before yeah. or 40 years before. Or do you say, like, no, try to do it exactly with the same technology as, as it was done then? Or oh, are no. you saying, like, no, don't do it at all? No, no, I mean, you can never stop creativity. It's a crime. 
So if somebody is going to create a very bad version of my work, they are welcome to it. <laughs> uh, they at least are creating something, right? It's like when you see a bad sculpture on the street corner and you think about, is it better to have a bad sculpture or no sculpture? And you know, it's better to have the bad one. You know. it's, at least it's a human endeavor, it is something. So I encourage all of you to copy my work. In the 60s, uh, no, it was already the beginning of the 70s, there were these uh, people in Chicago, they did wonderful work. And at the end, they always put a thumb and uh, the, these things over it, cross, X, and underneath it, copy it right. And they should have said, copy it right, sucker. You know, because there were so many bad copies going around. And we, uh, they couldn't care less if people copied it, but copy it right, you know which of course will never be done, you know that, but it's kind to remind them. So what else is there to say? Um, well, I think... Um, we don't have that much time if we also still want to look at stuff, so... I think um, the archiving thing is one thing, and but what I'm also interested in is hearing from you a little bit about these special environments because they are poorly documented. I mean, your work, the, the end result, we can still see um, in all the uh, works that go around. Yeah. But they, they come out of uh, you being in a very interesting environment um, in Santa Fe, but also in Buffalo, um, in New York, and I, I think connected to that is the whole um, dream of um, the fusion of art and science. Yeah. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about this, because this is, for the uh, biggest part, it's not documented anywhere, but it's very interesting to hear a little bit from you about it. Well, I mean, um, I have it well documented, because I always keep copies of everything. See, it used to be called the intermaterial. You would have an original. And then you do endless what are called intermaterials, where you are pro processing the footage. And I kept all of this. And uh, so it would be very easy to come in and, uh, and recreate it. But for other people, like maybe you know the name George Kuchar. He died recently, he was a filmmaker. He said that as soon as he had made his master, he threw out, he didn't even recycle it, he just threw it out mercilessly. So it's going to be much more difficult to to trace him, uh, to trace what he did, to the work. So we are all different on that, so I cannot talk for myself. I'm kind of pretty good. I took all these intermaterials and I count them, called them UA. I put a uh, sticker on them, UA. And it stood for... Uh, undocumented aliens, because that time there was the big thing in the United States, you had to throw out all the undocumented aliens. So I thought it was an appropriate name, but then I didn't throw them out. So, And the un undocumented aliens are still all over the United States. So, but it went well. Do we have... Yeah. yeah, could we... You do want to have the screen yeah, of yeah. your computer to be... Yeah. Shown here. I have to have it shown there. So can you put it up? I see something nice since the last three minutes. And okay, let's see. You don't get video? Uh, yeah. Of course, it doesn't work if you have two screens. Um, okay, can I stop it once? Yeah, more? you can't do anything. Uh, okay, let's just do as simple as that. So we want to just have Yeah, we just do the screen sharing, sharing and then. But don't worry, if you can't show this... No, no, it's going to work, it's going to work. Seems, um, except now we're out of the To hear a little bit from you about this, I mean, you have been working all your life with technology, creating art, and you've always um, dealt with engineers, mathematicians, etc. Yeah. And uh, since... I think the last 10, 15 years, this whole idea, this utopian idea of art and science being the best uh, yeah. mix ever, 
maybe you can reflect a bit on that because you've been around so long that you have had uh, these cycles uh, a few times, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, it's like um, it is kind of a pipe dream because uh, you feel empathy for the science. I, I don't know any artist who doesn't read scientific magazines. Uh, they are just into it. And I mean, science is so great, especially now with all this brain discovery and the outer space. I mean, it has never been better. And uh, that's also reflected in a lot of works that artists do, is this... Uh, fascination with science and uh, and they uh, I think that artists understand also this uh, this creative frenzy you know that suddenly you have something that you have to go into and uh, and you are obsessed the obsession and everything we have that in common and the scientists know that too they recognize but they just don't recognize the art because the art is to them is uh, illegible and stupid and boring. I mean, usually they haven't done anything. Uh, they, they don't listen to anything from, uh, since Johann Sebastian Bach, you know. That's for them. The, so what we're going to see now? But that's a question because, I mean, with Sonic X and also in your work as Telco Systems, you're very interested in the history of uh, this art science get together. Kind of, we dive also into the histories of this and the kind of utopian ideas that there were about this in the in the 60s. And I have rather the idea that it was, as a utopian idea, bigger in the 60s or 70s than it is now. Yeah, but maybe that has also to do with, at that time, um, Stan Vanderbeek was at the board of NASA talking to them about shipping off a uh, big artwork into outer space and to make this art network, satellite art network around the globe and you have this EAT Pepsi Pavilion made together. I mean, at that point, if you look now, for instance, at uh, CERN, they have an art program, then you can do something nice with the footage they provide, but you're not allowed to turn the knobs of the Large Hadron mm -hmm. Collider. So there's a slight shift in what you're allowed to do as an artist. Huh? It's the same with Bell Labs. I mean, when uh, you were there, and I think also when Lillian Schwartz was around, that, that period it was such a um, different view on these boat, you know, the weight of boat was, I think the measurement was just different, how how it was. Yeah, yeah. They they thought at least then they needed us, the, the scientists, or we were kind of a nice fun for them, sort of pets or something, but they don't need us anymore, and I think we are more alienated uh, in that sense, you know. But but the interesting thing is that in a, on a social level, yeah. um, Artists and scientists are both uh, hanging up, you know, in the same bars or in the same yeah. social environment. I mean, there's still this connection yeah. and still. also this difference from other parts of society. But yeah. somehow, in the you know the, the the way art is looked at from a science perspective, that has changed. Well, uh, there isn't Leonardo anymore. I mean, there was this famous Leonardo that uh, that could do both unbelievably. I mean, his art is unbelievable, and what he was discovering. Well, it was more technology, though, than, than science. You know, uh, people don't come that way anymore. Well, the, the big change in the 60s in terms of big science. In the what? 60s, economic change, the, the, the science is now so tied up in Yeah. 
maybe we have to kind of track back also to uh, the issue of archiving, and I'll try to do it from uh, from this. Um, you could almost say that now, especially online, there's so much of the past available that um, the whole idea of a past has almost collapsed. It's has become we have become in a present where we're constantly revisiting the past mm -hmm. but not even anymore as a nostalgia but just as it has become the present this constant revisiting of the past and this constant reinterpretation of the mm -hmm. past mm -hmm. um, and especially in uh, more the world of um, be pop music and more popular electronic music this has <laughs> come up with the idea that this actually stalls the creating of really new things and that what is lacking is kind of really an, a future which is an open space to be invented um, or maybe that's a question to both of you how would you feel about about that Does it's very confusing it, uh, I mean I, 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 I just don't know if I have opinions because things have changed so drastically just in the last 10 years I mean that everybody has a telephone in their pocket and takes something as mundane as that and it is considered, you know, self-evident that you have your telephone in the pocket. Everything and also your complete archive. <laughs> so, yeah, right. So... If you, yeah, if you look at the last ideas that Facebook has about, like, recording your complete history. Mm -hmm. I mean, Lucas, how do you think about that? Don't use it. I don't know. No, no, not about Facebook, but about the idea that this um, presence, this this complete presence of the past, kind of does it is it stalling, or do you rather create from the idea of the future as this big open space? This is that's well, still think, not filled I, in. I think that what you see is that uh, 40 years ago you had to. Uh, do a big. Um, you had to um, um, do a lot of work to get into um, a certain archive or to get access to certain knowledge. So you had to be determined. You had to know what you wanted, and then still it was unclear if you could get it. And now, I, I think the rules are the same, but we just think differently about it. But if you want to get the specific uh, thing that is floating around somewhere, you still have to do a lot of work to get it. And um, so I think the, the easy access to everything is, is just, uh, um, for big big part, is an illusion because the massive amount of everything being available, the whole past being accessible, makes it also inaccessible because it's so much. And mm -hmm. so um, in that sense, you still need to put a lot of effort in it in order to get what you want. To, um, especially if you're looking for less obvious things that are not in top 25 lists of whomever is providing you their advertised info. So for me, the past is still uh, something uh, very much we have to dig into. And um, you have, But it's only relevant in, in, in a certain context. Yeah. As, um, but this also relates, and I want to kind of wrap up things as well. Relates a sort of a certain history of time, especially in the early 70s, that kind of is not available at all, and that maybe only lives on as an oral history, as people that kind of we might archive now. And it also relates to uh, the work of the Vesulkas, which, because we have this great archive, but which stopped 12 years ago. Yeah. It is, in a sense, uh, your older work is more known than ever, probably. Yeah. But I remember, like, we were talking before here this morning and asking you, like, well, what are you making nowadays? Yeah. Because that's not what we find at Fazulka. It's Dot almost or. like the, the, the reverse... <laughs> The reverse of, of what you would expect, that everything is available when you make it. But um, but we're also going to show something of yeah. Steiner. Oh, I even found it. What are we okay. looking uh, at? Well, we're now looking at the desktop. But will we? So this is Imagine. 
that uh, has been talked about. Uh, the history is that when, when I arrived, I mean, I, I had met Michelle many times, and we were good friends, and Michelle asked Woody, and not me, if, if uh, I should be the co-director of Stein. And, uh, or Michelle asked Woody permission that they could do that. I, I don't know how it went, but anyhow, uh, suddenly they just said, you are going to be the uh, co-director. So I came to Stein, and Tom was there, and, and Michelle, and they said, we are, uh, are going to write a video program for you. And I remember I looked at Tom and I said, yeah, 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 <laughs> software, video and software, it, it needs so much more power than any computer you have. It is uh, hopeless, but I thought that they were just two stupid guys, and I treated it like that. But in no time, they started having those things. It started making sense. Uh, resolution... Uh, 423, what is it, 32480 or whatever, and uh, or even sm smaller like one, was, what was the smallest one? 120, what was it, Joel? 160, 120. 160, 120. And uh, maybe it would just move every 15 frames instead of 30. But there started to be all kinds of goodies on there. And um, uh, I don't know even how to get there because now I have changed the uh, the uh, w the view. Would I have to put it back? Can anybody help me with this? It's this bit one, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So here I am. Okay. So this is. Um, this is Imagine, and uh, we can do very nice things with it, like this. I'll, t I'll do a little tech, tech thing. It has what's called dust, which is this. And actually, to this date, I haven't seen almost any of these effects on any other software programming, and I don't know why, but Imagine is basically dead, except for me using it. And I cannot explain why, because it is, like you see, it's a totally marvelous program. And it can make all kind of noise, which, see, like this here, that you have to move in order to move it. And um, hmm, here, well, yeah. Looks even better here on the screen. <laughs> See, they're like, how did I get this? I don't even know. I would have to see see my score, how, how it is. But it is it is a very rich program, and it's for free. <laughs> it's for a download, and the man who made it lives in this town. And how many of you have ever seen any images of Imagine? You see, not that many. It's amazing. Yep, here they are. So, but I'm not, I'm not selling it because uh, Tom has stopped maintaining it already years ago and so it is slowly deteriorating, which is something that might be interesting to talk about with archives and everything, the preservation, especially of software, that it deteriorates and it deteriorates. You say, how is it possible? These are bits and bytes, they are forever. The operation program, you know, goes from OS 9 to OS 10 to Lion and Snow Lion and uh, uh, all those things. And every time they change that, a lot of software just goes out. It's not functional anymore. But let me see. I'm going to go to what's called. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a problem. Maybe. See, I, I don't have, how do I make the screen smaller? Yeah. Uh, that's something, I don't know. An upper left, like here? Yeah, not the best, not that. This one. No, I just have to see enough yeah, to get the menu. Yeah. 
<laughs> the trouble is we're we are doing um, yeah. we're doing uh, Oh, maybe I can have it. Yeah, now I can see it. Yeah. It's okay. I go to presets and go to movies. And here and he is. Here we can are. we have sound? Getting to the end of uh, this session, I'm afraid. Um, so maybe we still have a few minutes for questions from the audience because I don't want you to have to be quiet, absolutely, except for Joel, who has to open his mouth anyway. So, is there um, are there questions uh, from the audience? Yes. There's free frame plugins that are kind of video uh, manipulation plugins. I, I mean, I've played around a bit with this program, Modulate. I think um, Rosa there as well knows a lot more about it than I do. But there's a free, there's like open source uh, plugins. People write for them. Um, and is this in any way like? I mean, they do similar things, particles and whatever. Should I read first? <laughs> Uh, I recently visited Bill Etra in New York, uh, who works to closely together with a friend of mine, Anton Marini, and they actually also recreate his um, installations, his synthesizers into the digital, which sometimes, I mean, were you a lot collaborating? Do you still speak? Uh, you and Bill Etra and this 
old friendship groups? Yeah. Because, I mean, this is what you're referring to anyway, to these plugins that Faye, uh, the, the guy from New York, is programming. But, well, I don't, I don't know. That's what you're asking if... Is so there a direct connection? <laughs> what? <laughs> so the question if it is the, um, uh, the, the, the filters that Imagine uses, is it connected to the software that's developed by the person yeah, that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Etra, uh, not Etra synthesizer. Uh, see, well, what Tom did was, and I asked him a lot later, how did you get to those effects? Because he, he was a good photographer, but he was particularly a video person, video effects person. And he said, I, I looked at your tape. <laughs> he never told me that. But because uh, I have some demo tapes of this. That's another thing we always did was demo tapes. And we, we sent each other demo tapes. We, we sent to Etra and he sent to us and back and forth. So one of the effects in here is indeed the Rat Etra effect. But uh, the, the most interesting, which I forgot to show you, and uh, so you, you just don't know what to show like that, five minutes, uh, is uh, made by Bill Spinhoven, who in, when he was at Aki here in Enstede. And it was the one that uh, took each line and froze it, and uh, it, it is embedded into the video image that you can you can address line by line. And uh, Tom just looked at it and said, I, I can do this on the computer. Uh, another one, um, if you know Big Guy, which is, uh, I think, one of the major uh, achievements of Stein, uh, because now it is it is a routine. It's used everywhere. Everybody, they they even use it, you know, for surveillance and uh, whatever. This this detection of motion in space. And uh, there was this uh, two guys, uh, students at Aki again, who uh, who uh, uh, mapped it so that uh, if you moved in space, it would become sound. And uh, and then uh, just time took it over and. Uh, wrote Big Eye, and now it is called uh, Usual Emotion Tracking, and everybody must have it, every dance company and everywhere. So uh, that, that was another one. It, see, it was always taken from before, or basically uh, taken from these things that had been done in analog, and then were rewritten for uh, digital. And it's a shame that the development stopped. It would have been nice to keep doing those special effects or fil filters, uh, filmmakers like to call them. Okay. Thank you. One last question, maybe. Dick says. <laughs> yeah, it's already time for a long time. So I want to. <laughs> Thank you all for your um, extreme for your attention and thanks very much.